I'm also really pleased to be here this evening because uh, the, in 1962 my father was appointed to a title uh, in St George's Sheffield, which is not a million miles from here, I think he's now in this parish. And the church had a parish worker, full time, and after full three years training, she was in her second parish, and in order to keep the curate under control and make sure that he knew that he was junior on the staff, Rita, she married him. <laughs> But this is not family history, uh, this is uh, all about uh, penguins, uh, or rather it's, uh, uh, it's about mission. Uh, a couple of years ago now I was uh, part of the London delegation to an interdiocesan learning community on how dioceses are planning their mission strategy. Confession likely to drive the uh, Catholics amongst you to a frenzy before I even Gun. We were asked to read this book, Our Iceberg is Melting, by somebody called John Cotter. It's all about how people respond to change, and the first thing you have to do is to persuade them that it's desperate that change should take place by talking about a thing called a burning platform, which of course melts your iceberg, and then you're in all kinds of trouble if you happen to be a penguin. Well, we're not penguins, uh, although we might sometimes dress like them, and we are sometimes rather bemused and upset by this kind of language. And what I want to try to do is to help us to see what a Catholic mission, missional language might look like. And to answer the question, why evangelize, to start with. And the answer for Anglican Catholics must be, of all stamps, must be because it's Christocentric. It is the incarnation of students as it is about so much of our theology. Father Congreve, of whom we've already heard, who's in search of a publisher, type of books, um, has uh, wrote that Christ has taken human nature and made all one. To help in the salvation of souls, he wrote, is not accidental, but vital for every Christian. And he went on that to bring the good news is not a favour that we do for the heathen, but a necessary instinctive action of the new nature of Christ, which is in us. When there is a response in a soul and someone comes to Christ, he asserted that those who evangelize and those who have been evangelized receive the message and are united. And so he wrote that in turn we ourselves, we who do the evangelism, we ourselves receive help and grace from those who are one to Christ. The church without them is incomplete, and all the members share in the enrichment of life in virtue, which the conversion of each new member brings. And so the church, in order to be healthy, must be, Congreve asserts, evangelistic. And he wrote that when a church loses its missionary enthusiasm and allows, allows indifference as to the conversion of heathen nations, its own Christianity begins to die out, as happens to the British church refusing to join in the conversion of the hated Saxons. And all this is framed by Congreve note in the context of the church as a whole, not of individual evangelists. And so if we start with the Incarnation, if we start with Christology, mission swiftly becomes a matter of the Church, of Ecclesiology. We are high church in the proper sense of that. We're not a recruiting club or a membership organisation, but we are seeking to baptise into the body of Christ of which we have a high view. And what distinguished the Church from any other group was the teaching, the prayer, and the breaking of bread. And so we go to Mass, and we are fed there, and we go out with the grace that we have received there to call others to share in what we have received. And so what we are evangelising for, ultimately, is for people who are baptised and communicants, people who are members of Christ's body, not merely a group of individuals who claim salvation. And so the church is therefore a mixed thing. It's both a visible society and a spiritual community. 
And so it is that as Catholics we become interested in institutions and structures. And that has led us to a problem with mission. Frank Weston, there he is in his Beretta, famous for his speech about Catholics finding the poor as much in the slum as in the tabernacle and finding Christ amongst the poor when he addressed the Anglo-Catholic Congress in 1923. Frank Weston accused the other two bishops on my slide here, uh, the bishops of Mombasa, Peel and Uganda, John Wimps, of heresy. And he said that they'd fallen into heresy because they'd received Holy Communion as an interdenominational missionary congress in Kenya, in Kikuyu, amongst non-Anglicans. It was a Catholic refusal to agree to a pan-Protestant missionary church, which it was hoped could be set up in Africa, leaving behind European divisions, which were seen as inhibiting and hindering mission. Now, I'm not going to get into that particular issue and how that was resolved. But I want to say what we all know, that the bishop matters. And who the bishop is matters to us. And we know that only too well in today's Church of England as Anglican Catholics across the spectrum of what that means. And something I've learned from my work alongside Bishop Sarah is to name the elephant in the room. She's brilliant at saying there's an elephant over there, let's bring it here and let's talk about it. To recognise the issues. And we need to recognise that our divisions on this matter have been debilitating for our mission. And thanks be to God that we are now, slowly, learning how to find structures, ecclesiologies, which however tentative and possibly experimental, are coming slowly, we believe, to work. Where they work is where we have good relationships. And this brings me back to Father Congreve. We talked about cordiality, which is the antithesis, in a way, of Bishop Weston throwing around accusations of heresy. Congreve wrote, cordiality is not the same thing as toleration. Cordiality is sincerest delight in each other's successes, sincerest sympathy in each other's troubles. We are, he wrote, not created to be perfected in our individual distinctiveness. The man who lives for himself in himself dwindles morally. His personality grows smaller and meaner. But in proportion as he lives for others, his personality grows rich and large. It is not official courtesy that makes character dilate, but the giving of the heart, cordiality. And he goes on to say, there is often cordiality enough, and of the true sort, amongst its own members within each of our distinctive groups. This was written over a hundred years ago, brothers and sisters. We haven't changed. There is often cordiality enough within our distinct groups. What we still wait for is the overflow of love towards persons and institutions outside our own mystic enclosure, who do not echo our phrases, but who do love what we love most, and live by the same life, which is our life. And so it's no surprise as we have begun to work out a settlement to our modern round of disagreements, that our mission has begun to thrive a bit more insofar as we have begun to work out that settlement. But we're no longer really confident as Anglican Catholics that our mission works. Or at least what we do for our mission. Like Father Naylor, I like a nice mass. But a nice mass is not what they like. They like a nice drum kit. Or they seem to. So what I want to try and speak about a little bit is relational and personal mission. Starting with individuals and exploring a series of relationships on a spiritual, theological and practical level to see how Anglican Catholics can grow in mission through the relationships which we nurture. And I want to start by talking about mission as personal holiness. I've been quoting Father Congreve. He wanted to be a missionary in India or in Africa. He joined the Society of St. John the Evangelist as one of the 
earlier county fathers in order to try to do so. But he wasn't past fit to go abroad. And he realised that his route to serving others was going to be personal holiness. He wrote that communion with God is itself a great work than which none is more invigorating to the whole community or more influential in the advance of Christ's kingdom. Communion with God is the great work which most advances the kingdom. And he criticised what he called the snare of activity, activity without the depth of personal holiness. He said that that approach is bad for the church and bad for the missioner. He has a passage in which he criticises the contemporary Catholic revival parish for its manifold activity. I'll post these things online later so you can read it, read it in detail. But activity as an end in itself, he says, becomes wearisome. And echoing the thoughts in the modern church about well-being, he says that such activity will lead to spiritual weariness, bodily health and strength overtaxed and exhausted by the perpetual nerve strain of a life which has no repose. And the body's breakdown reacts upon the mind, which is left alone in the burden of both. When I finish my share of the church's business, I have little time left and less inclination to pray. Whatever strength of any kind was in me is used up in the continual supply of the external proprieties of religion. The interior life I must leave to others. But, you know, I have my reward. He wrote, the church is successful, the offertory pays, congregations increase. Sometimes the, the whole fabric comes down with a crash. But even suppose it lasts on, he wrote, you will find symptoms of spiritual dry rot in the foundations. Men wonderfully familiar with the details of religious services and with the outward exhibition of religion, who are heartily to Souls, souls given to Christ through the graces that he works in us, says Congreve, are the most important thing, not the upholstery of the church. And so he wrote, we have known lives that were retired seemed withdrawn from all useful activity by special vocation or by permanent bodily infirmity, withdrawn by these means from what seemed to be all useful activity. We knew perhaps that there, that still life in the interior castle was the secret of the courage and the victories of many fights below in the plain, because their life was not merely withdrawn from men, but was given to God, separated from men in order to strive for them with God in the solitude of prayer. Now, I've written elsewhere of the striking similarities that I see between Father Congreve and St. Therese of Lisieux, uh, between this elderly male Anglican who travelled the world and the young enclosed drummer like who died before she was 30. Now, one of St. Therese's ministries was to write to priest missionaries who were being sent out to the Far East, many of whom faced martyrdom. One of them, uh, Père Hunand sent her a list of significant dates in his life. And one of these was September the 8th, our lady's birthday, which had been the date of Therese's own religious profession. She wrote a letter to him. On September the 8th, 1890, your missionary vocation was saved by Mary, Queen of Apostles and Queen of Martyrs. On that same day, a little Carmelite became the spouse of the King of Heaven, bidding an everlasting adieu to the world she had one goal, to save souls, especially the souls of apostles. From Jesus, her divine spouse, she asked particularly for an apostolic soul. Unable herself to be a priest, she wanted that in her place a priest may receive the graces of the Lord, that he may have the same aspirations, the same desires of as herself. And to raise this enclosed nun who went nowhere, is, of course, the universal patron of missions. Her intercession, her work of prayer, and her offering of sacrifices of love serve to save souls directly and through the astounding influence of her writings. The teaching of the religious is that personal holiness engenders and develops relationships with others, and that Christian relationships are necessarily missional because through his members Christ reaches out into the world. Since the incarnation is stupid, it's Christology becoming ecclesiology, becoming personal holiness. And so in what will now be a sort of more practical phase of this lecture, I want to talk about a series of other forms of relationship that 
that become mission. Um, organisational relationships. Um, I've been working with someone who's been looking at me with me at the strategy for our churches in central London. And he pointed out that developing strategy for anything needs not to start with the organisation, but with the people, with personality, relationships, and then to move on to organisation. And our issue with that is that as Catholics, as I've said, we have a concern for the institution of the church. But we shouldn't be allowing that to hold us back. It's not that we have to wait for the organisation to be right before we can do anything. It's not organisation that stops us doing anything, but relationships. And it's often said that culture and strategy for breakfast. Get the relationships changed and you can use a structure to do anything. And so to name more elephants, Mission in the Church of England has been held back in, 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 in an extended season of hopeless relationships, particularly for Anglican Catholics. And that's not just been in more modern times. There has been a misplaced kind of strictness which has looked to the orders and structures and not to relationships and to grace. This is Frank Weston again. Again, I'll, 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 I'll post it so you can read it in detail later. He, this is a, a strictness that replaced the, the joyful disciplines of personal holiness with a kind of tart harshness, harshness, which actually, sadly, in people other than Westerners, often mixed with a rather, rather lack of, of personal holiness and of personal discipline. And we've ended up with things like the notice on the door of a church, which I read in 1987, and which really rather speaks for itself about the welcome that you can receive in this particular Anglican Catholic Church. Which is not to say that we should give up on the disciplines of the Catholic faith. There is a joyful discipline. We can learn from uniformed youth organisations where young people flock to the sense of belonging, self-respect and order which a well-run cadet union can give. I am the London Area Chaplain for Sea Cadets. There are loads of rules in such an organisation. But they're kept with joy and pride as a means to the growth to which the cadet aspires. There's even rules, you see the bow on the side of the, uh, 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 of the, the headgear there? There's rules about how you iron it, how you tie it. But it's done with joy. And so we still teach the Eucharistic fast and the necessity of the confessional. But as a matter of joyful invitation to relationship, not as a matter of dour rule keeping. Relationships are the foundation of things, not organisation. At this point, I want to talk a little bit about parishes. Parishes are changing, and they have been for some time. Where is the parish in which my parents ministered? It's not there any longer, it's here. The whole concept of the parish, though, is under question. And this is a problem for many of us Anglican Catholics, because we've seen the parish as a kind of redoubt. Here, in my parish, but well, I am Pope in my own parish, but the Archdeacon say what he likes. Here, we can do it our way. Whatever might be happening over there, and where they're doing it their way, with their drunkard and all that other stuff which we don't like. Which is, of course, to see the parish as an atomizing structure which breaks relationships down. It's saying you can't come here rather than as a uniting structure which says, here is our community. Now, I with you have a theology of the cure of souls. I've read my prayer book and I know that we have a duty to everyone. I've also read the book of the prophet Ezekiel about watchmen and all of those things. But even the most traditional parish is no longer actually quite a cure like that, even if it ever was. Geography is stronger than many would assert, but things are changing the ability to travel and the availability of information. It's not just a town people thing that people have a choice. In rural areas as well, though people will often still look to our village church, just as in the town, they'll look to the church which creates their community. But nevertheless, many people drive to, to these churches from a distance. And in all kinds of ways, people have chosen the church they go to, possibly because they used to go to it, now they've moved away, we come back to it. The reality is that parish is being steadily eroded. 
And this is a slide which I should just press a few buttons one after the other. And this is not my slide, this is a slide from Philip James, who is the Head of Strategy and Development at the National Church Institutions. And his thesis is that there is this cycle that has caused the parish to decline. Attendance falls, money reduces, ministry is withdrawn. Attendance falls, money reduces, ministry is withdrawn. All 15 goes pop. And one answer has been the multi-parish benefits, but he asserts that that just simply exacerbates the problem because the ministry is stretched even thinner and things continue to decline. And what he did for us was when he presented to us, I've got his permission to share these slides by the way, uh, what he did to us when he spoke to us as a senior staff in the Diocese of London was to say that uh, lots of dioceses are looking at all kinds of radical ways of saying, well actually the parish is not any longer the fundamental structure. Uh, Birmingham uh, has uh, got a, a, a new way of looking at things. Uh, Portsmouth is doing a thing called disappointment um, by pastoral reorganisation. Uh, Carlisle has ecumenical approaches uh, with strong relationships with the Methodists and others, which again touches sharply on our ecclesiology. In Suffolk, in St. Edmundsbury and Ipswich, there is a diocesan bishop's mission order, which allows the bishop to accredit what are called lightweight groups anywhere in the diocese when somebody fills a form and says, I'd like to do one of those, please. And if the bishop says yes, then you can do it without any further consultation now. You can just get on with it. So these things are, all of them, changing the way that parishes are looked at, even with our own structures. And we don't actually, this is uh, Philip James's slide about what we do if we had a, a, a blank piece of paper with which to work. Well, actually, we don't how much we might want one. So for Catholics, what we need to think about is not can we sustain and can we keep the parish going, because brothers and sisters, it's on its way out, even if it was the feast of St. Theodore a couple of days ago who established the parochial system um, in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, uh, 7th century, 7th, 8th century for us. What we need to think about is, what does the parish deliver that a Catholic ecclesiology would wish to sustain, and how can we ensure that we are in the debate making sure that those things are delivered? And we would be looking for things like a commitment to total coverage. Not rushing to the low-hanging fruit that looks easy, but going into all communities, including the places which are tough, where we might only manage presence and engagement, because 95% of the population is actively an adherent of another faith, or because actually the modern secular view that says the TV is far more interesting than anything else anyone can offer is, uh, has taken off. Uh, total coverage. Um, how to divide the work up. I'm going to give a footnote here to Father. Father Naylor, who earlier in the conversation over tea helped me just to crystallise uh, this paragraph of my, of my, of my talk. Uh, how, to, how to divide the work up so that within the total that we still would wish to see, we can actually see which bit is mine, ours, which bit does our community serve, and this is for lay people as much as it is for clergy. Uh, how do we maintain ease of access? to all, even those who don't identify with the church at those moments when they might once again choose to do so, at those life-changing moments. How do we start with a contribution that will begin not with money, or with a burning platform, or with a melting iceberg, or with the institution, but from a love of God in Christ, which spills over into a desire for souls, and all souls, not just some of them. And the immediate reality for us as Anglican Catholics to wake up to is that there is money about at the moment for this thinking and for these kinds of responses. And what is working, in terms bluntly of numbers of people coming, will get funded. But there's also a real desire in the politics of this to see the money go to a broad range of churches so that Catholics who are felt to be underrepresented in all of this could get support for good ideas, which leads me to talk about money. By and large, our Anglican Catholic churches depend on others for our money. Luke Brotherton has very helpfully reflected on money in a marvellous little uh, uh, pamphlet uh, which is called Neither a Lender Nor a Borrower Be, which if you Google it, you'll find you can uh, pull up online. It's a great read, do have a look at it. And he makes the point that money is debt. There's a Dad's Army episode about it. You may remember it where Mr. Jones is 
50 pounds goes round with everybody in the thing, and they, and they never get split by anybody who goes round. There's another illustration of that. Brotherson suggests that there is usury, which is ripping people off, stripping them of their assets. Uh, but there's also debt, which is biblically licit, debt that is remitted in jubilee. Interest that is payment for using a lump of money for good and is then properly paid back. And that reminds me of a little thing about if you are doing a, a deal and do do them, that a good deal always leaves something in it for the other side so that they'll want to come back and do some more business with you. Historically, revival has come to the church when it's been rich. Today's Gospel reading, at least at the Mass I went to, which Bishop Sarah celebrated at, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the chapel in the, uh, in, in the, in the house, in, in the old deanery where, where we work, and unless you're afraid, those of you traditionalists, I go, I don't receive, and bless her, she and I have worked that one out. And we need to be living like this, praying with one another whenever we can, the absolute maximum levels of communion that we can achieve. But at that mass, we heard the Gospel from Luke 8 about the wealthy women. Mary Magdalene, who was wealthy enough to have her nard. Joanna, the wife of the steward. Jesus, Susanna, who supported the mission with their resources. These were rich people. Barnabas gave the gift of the field. Annas and Sapphira were struck down dead for not doing so. Silas and Timothy arrived in Corinth with the money so that Paul could be released from tent making and could get on with the mission, stop becoming a self, stop being a self supporting minister and be fully equipped. This is no, not to diss self supporting ministers before the sky falls in on my head, uh, but it is to say that the, the arrival of resources freed him to do more. And we, in the early church, hear about Lawrence uh, with the wealth of the Roman church. And the research that's gone into showing by AD 251, these were the figures about how the, uh, between half and a million societies a year, uh, donated by the 30 to 50,000 Christians in the city of Rome, supported 46 presbyters, seven deacons, and the rest there on the slide. The conversion of Georgia in about the year 303 by the great St. Nino, who bound a cross together with her hair and converted Queen Nana. England began to be converted when the well-funded mission of St. Augustine was able to make and keep royal connections. Fast forward to the flowering of Anglican religious orders and read Sir Ernest James' James's book about the founding of the Cali Fathers and the others, and you'll see that the ones that succeeded were the ones that had money. Uh, Father Richard Mew Benson was the inheritor of the money from Mew Breweries. Uh, Congreve was an old Etonian. Money flows from the wealth of the church to the poor. But it's always the case in Christian history that it's the rich who give to the poor and who emulate the one who emptied himself who was full with the pleroma, with the fullness of God, who emptied himself for us, it is when that imitation takes place that the church thrives. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to speak against a, against a bias to the poor. There needs to be that bias to the poor if we're going to stay true to the gospel. What I am arguing for is a good use of money and a clear-sighted recognition that romantic poverty won't get us very far. And, brothers and sisters, it never has. Every Francis needs his Bonaventura. Uh, in his Voices of Moribeth, Eamon Duffy, using church wardens' accounts for the whole period of Reformation, describes the late medieval parish's structure with its various stalls. These were the different shrines to which, which were each individually endowed. And there was the church's farm which wasn't a farm, it was a bit of a field in each person's small holding. There was the church's flock, which is one sheep in each person, in each farmer's flock. A funding structure based neither on free will offering, nor on endowment, <coughs> but on community. And that was dismantled at the Reformation in favour of individual donations, <coughs> which led us to dependence on patronage, or endowment, or giving. 
And as we've said earlier, when people in London think of the revival in London, they often talk, or church planting in London, they often talk about HTV and the wealthy have been so generous to that church in its past, one of which I supported and I asked them for a mission business plan and I said, can I see your mission business plan? And the, the vicar who was going to be reopening this church had been closed for 25 years said, no, you can't. And I said, well, if you haven't got one, I'm sorry, you know, this is going to go, go pear shaped And he said, no, no, no. He said, I don't know how much they give, but the treasurer of HTV is taking a side step. Keep those two happy. It's all right. But giving by the relatively rich is not actually the only way. And partnerships, relationships, are much more healthy than being dependent on that kind of patronage. In top, a partnership with a housing association to redevelop the crumbling church hall, which was next door to our church, transformed a burden into an asset. Nine new social housing units, which were valued at £400,000, and instead of receiving £400,000, this is in 1999, 2000 money, they put the hall up for us. We netted it all off one against the other, bang, not a new community hall for us to use as a church hall as well, and social housing units. Everyone's happy, everyone made a profit. Vision begets provision. And there's also the history of the churches in the City of London, which I now have care for as a key part of my archdeacon. A few years ago, they were very much on their uppers, actually. They were revitalised then, by a similar use of partnership opportunities. In June this year, there was a significant change to national church funding assumptions about inflation and interest rates. Doesn't sound very interesting. But actually, what that will do is to release their bishops nodding at me. Unless in the cat out of the bag, but it is now public, isn't it? Yes. They raise £50 million pounds a year into the Church of England's overall coffers. This will enable the pension deficit to be cut back, which will in effect give a grant to every diocese. But it also releases money for mission. And in that context, as mission, it, there is a the renewal and reform programme is providing a means by which that money can be channeled to the local church. And the resource churches are part of that. And I see that you've had the Bishop of Islington here. If I have it right though, we need to be a bit careful. St. Eversbury and Ipswich has received a grant of 4.95 million pounds. And their objective in doing that, their output, which will prove that they spent the money well, but with they'll bring two and a half thousand new people to church as a result of that. That's uh, 1,980 pounds each, if you want to go to church in she just asked the bishop for the bribe, that'll be fine. <laughs> we need to have confidence and the willingness to offer ourselves as resource churches. And more than that, we need to be prepared to work with those who are resource churches so that we can be resourced, so that we can become resource churches. For Catholic parishes, we're often serving the less well-off and we're serving poor areas. Don't get me wrong, I know that. I was a parish priest in one of the most deprived corners of London. But what would a thousand pounds do in your parish? And is there somebody out there? Is there one of the Catholic societies? Is there a donor who might find that one thousand pounds for you? And if so, what would you do with it? Because vision begets provision. How can we offer that someone who might have that thousand pounds something that they might wish to fund? And even for our poor, perhaps especially for our poorest churches, those donors are out there. And it's relationships from which this funding can flow. There's much to be gained from a deeper understanding of our opportunities in our local areas. Funds collected under Section 106 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990 and community infrastructure levy, which is the new version of that, these are public monies which have to be spent in local communities. Whenever you do a, whenever you do a, a, a building project, if you put up some swanky new flats and things, this is a bit of tax. It has to go to the local authority, and the local authority have to spend it on community infrastructure. At the end of 2018, if I read this correctly, Sheffield City Council had £4 million of unspent community infrastructure levy, 
of which 700,000 is available for local projects. Father, we can help them to spend some of that. It's about partnership with local authorities and elsewhere. In the City of London, for example, we have a lot, we do, 75% of the public open space in the City of London is churchyard. It's very, very expensive to manage. It's looked after by the local authority for us, but we still own it. And we entered into a partnership with this, the Corporation of the City of London to bring community infrastructure levy money to those churchyards so that we can offer them more effectively to city workers who are desperate for green open space in order to be able to help them in their workplaces which are often so, so tight. And we have opportunities when we brought people in in that way, one of our churches we've got cafes, in others we've got, uh, uh, we've got coffee barriers on the front doorsteps and that enables us to have the church open. Uh, we have uh, lunch groups and all those other things. There are places with post offices and the like. Once we've got our churches open in that way and drawn them in, as Catholics we have the most extraordinary opportunities to be able to help them with their prayer and to turn the cafe into a place of devotion. It's often said that this sort of stuff, putting a cafe into a church, destroys the sacred space. Remember when Jesus asked, what happens if something uh, unclean touches the clean thing? What, which way around is it? Does the clean thing become clean, or does the unclean, unclean thing, uh, uh, does the clean thing become unclean, or the other way around? And of course, Jesus, uh, when he is touched by the woman with the flow of blood, his healing flows from her. And we have the opportunities from lighting of candles to prayer cards to the opportunity to. Uh, to, to have a mass said, the Blessed Sacrament in its tabernacle, the place to pause and write an intercession. We have tools in the Catholic armory for the sacralization of this space and to help people with no grammar of prayer to be able to respond with sighs too deep for words. Now all of this raises a question particularly for those in church leadership moment I'm just going to address a little bit towards the clergy, although actually this also affects um, uh, all of us, lay and all day. The Catholics aren't very concerned with the clergy, and uh, when archdeacons ask about things like community infrastructure levy and so on, the clergy very often say, well, who am I? Am I a pastor? Am I a priest? Or are you turning me into a manager or a fundraiser or a financier? And it's true to say that amongst the clergy there is a culture change underway as some clergy start to push for change from office holder towards employee. And this is important because it's about a change of relationship, which changes therefore the structures of our activity, as I've been arguing. Is the vicarage a hub of hospitality and parish activity, or is it a private house? Catholics go for the relation, and in theory we would rather have people to our homes than to the parish office, but do we actually do more than chuckle about sacrificial ministry while pouring the next gin and telling the parishioners we don't really have time? And how genuinely do we look after ourselves so that we can function? This needs to be about good ordering of healthy lifestyles. But for Anglican Catholics, laity and clergy, healthy must also be godly. And Congreve put his finger on what is a sense of unease of those Catholics in the whole language of well-being when, reflecting on the busy life of duty, he encouraged his brethren to remain focused on God. The Lord's remedy for the overstrain of our life is not arrange your work better or work harder or give up your holiday. No, what the Lord says is come unto me and I will give you rest. And discussing what we would now call stress, he said, The soul was created for God, to work in God, to bear its sorrows to God. If we don't focus on God, we find ourselves working with an uneasy conscience, dragging along a chain of responsibilities not fully faced, duties neglected, and a feeling of despair at ever getting one's work and oneself right. And the medicine for this, he said, is not simply a break. It was very likely not change of air, I wanted, he wrote, or relaxation from work when the doctor said I needed rest. It was another need, which mere cessation of work does not supply. Refreshment comes from sharing work in Christ. In the fellowship of Jesus Christ, work does not exhaust, but invigorates and refreshes us. And so once again, it's not about the structure, 
but how we hold roles. I'm not arguing by the way for working ourselves to death or not having a day off, but I am arguing that we should be focusing on Christ in all of this, not on how many hours work we've had, we've done. And so often we do find ourselves in roles which are not quite what we think is right or what we were trained for or what I was ordained to do. But if our church, if Christ needs me to be a manager or a financier or a webmaster, can I Catholicise that by serving in those ways in close relationship with God and neighbour? You might be an employee. Can you behave like a priest, even if they make you an archdeacon? Leadership can be Catholic, even when it is perforce managerial, organisational and structural. But if we manage to stay relational to God first, and then to Him in others, then we will find that peace and that place where we can continue to exercise these roles in a way that works under Christ within his church. Which leads me to speak for a moment about membership and about relationships within the church. I was struck when I was new at being an archdeacon when I visited a new wine church, charismatic evangelical movement within the Church of England, and I saw how they defined membership. And all my Catholic hackers went, membership is about baptism. And they had four marks on membership, which were, you need to come to worship regularly. You need to be a member of a discipleship group. You need to be involved in one of our outreach programs and you need to give money to the church. And I thought, I've heard that before. And I went back to my Anglo-Catholic prayer book, which I'm now lost, so this is actually the everyday prayers of church movement folk, which is slightly different. But the Anglo Catholic prayer book says, Go to Mass on Sundays and solemnities. It says, Make sure that you're reading your Bible and are studying the scriptures, preferably with others. It says, Make sure you remember one of the guilds which serves the poor and the needy in our parish and make sure that you give money to the church. New wine, not new at all. It's our old wine skin that tells you how to do it and has been for years. Clear and explicit membership of community is central to helping people grow and helping people to stick once they've come through the door. And there are many practical aspects to this in how we should help people to capture names and addresses, how we involve people without smothering them, how in a small community it's better not to try and put a regular Sunday school on every week because it exhausts everybody and needs to never fed, but to do a series of major children's events, perhaps three or four times during the year, and you advertise the next one and the last one and you tumble them forward so that by the time they've been doing it for a little while they've been coming quarterly and, if you can, and then you can work them into other things by becoming service and so on and suddenly, hey presto, you're coming monthly and that's almost as often as most members of the PCC. <laughs> <laughs> and this works on a theological level as well. Membership of the church is about participation in the Eucharistic community. Many of us in the 80s were profoundly touched by John Zizoulas' assertion that the ecclesia, the congregation, specifically means the church, means the Eucharistic gathering, which is why we worry about the fresh expressions of church which stop short of the Mass, or churches which think of the Mass as a barrier, or conversely those such as messy churches, which in some of their incarnations can evacuate church from the Eucharist by offering it indiscriminately with no thought to membership. Catholic mission will take membership seriously by developing an ethos of taking the religious end of what we do and making sure that we honour it, place it at the centre. Praying really powerfully. I remember when the church I was talking about earlier that we reopened after 25 years, I went and found the priest and said as I arrived three quarters of an hour early for the first opening service, why aren't the doors open? Why haven't we opened there? There's people gathering outside. He said, because we haven't prayed at the door yet with the team, we're about to do that. No one's going through that door to be prayed there. That seriousness will help us to take seriously the consequences of membership, which flows out into mission, congruous phrase, the necessary instinctive action of the new nature of God within us. And that very seriousness will help us to be experimental with old forms and new. We can find tools again, such as the living rosary, parish novena, the faithful to be equipped to offer a Bible study at their desks at work, or a rosary at the water fountain, an experimental liturgy that can make the church easier to attend, rolling things, there's at least one church now which has a Sunday morning that starts at eight and finishes at one, there's a mass in the middle, there's loads of other stuff flowing in and through, 
And so you can come in and out whenever you like, just like you would to the rural coffee shop a few miles from Borsigan, where I went with my family one Sunday morning after having been to an early morning mass in the little village church. We hunted around to find one, and we, there were about three people there. But when in just as difficult a place to get to later in the morning, we found this place that was absolutely filled with people drinking coffee and reading the paper and doing all their stuff. Modeling church in a way that makes it easy for people for whom that is their model to be able to come and to participate. All of this is undoing the parish communion movement with its Lord's people on the Lord's day at the Lord's table at 9.30 in the morning. But it's just perhaps, it's not that it's, 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 it's wrong, it's just not so western. If you go to an Orthodox church on a Sunday, you'll find all that rolling stuff going on. <coughs> We began with the call to personal holiness and have ended in corporate worship. But it's all mission, as much about those who do not yet share our faith as it is about those who seek to grow in what we have received. And that's unsurprising, because my thesis is that Catholic mission is about relationships, and therefore unsurprisingly it begins and it ends in God. <laughs>